to check. So there's a sign in your email and there's three boxes and one is if you want to be on my mailing list and hear about any kind of future trainings offerings. The second box is if you want resources that I'm giving during this talk specifically. And then the third one is if, I don't know what the third one is. <laughs> oh, oh yes, yes. So I have a, um, a networking group that I periodically call together of people who are either working in the wilderness or interested in working in the wilderness. It's very loose. So if you would like to be on that specific invite list, you can check. And there's also flyers on this table um, from some of the people in the room who are offering some nature-based experiences as well. So at some point, if you want to sign up, please do. Okay, the other piece, so background, research, some practical tools, talking a little bit about what this looks like and um, how you can incorporate the natural world into the therapeutic process. This is one of my major passions in the world, to support people in doing this with whatever you're doing now, that you don't have to have a master's in wilderness therapy from Naropa to incorporate the natural world into your work. And hopefully a bit of inspiration. <coughs> Those are my goals for the night here. <coughs> and so to, this is a, a representation of me, so I'm gonna introduce myself here. And I grew up in the city, a suburb, Cleveland, Ohio. Wasn't really a nature girl growing up. And um, as soon as I started camping and finding um, camps, which was actually college, I fell in love immediately. And I said, this is what I want to do with my life. And I joke that now I'm a professional camp counselor. But, um, and so said, you know, I'm someone that says, I can do this. I read it in a book. And I go, yeah, I'm going to try this tomorrow. Um, and so I, uh, I started talking to people and asking about wilderness therapy, and at that point, this is now 20 years ago or so, this field wasn't very established. I mean, for many of you, this is still very new. But um, the first book in 1994, I was actually graduating from college, and a professor at my college in Ohio wrote a book called Wilderness Therapy, um, Berman and Berman. So, so it's, been, it's, it's grown hugely in that amount of time. So I came to, I, st I started working in the natural world. I worked for many organizations to begin with doing experiential education. So outward bound and outward bound type programs where it was very therapeutic in nature, but it wasn't a clinical, uh, clinical environment. Um, but people would have amazing transformations all the time. And, 
you know, do things that they've never done before and come out feeling empowered and confident and how many times I can't even count did I hear people say, wow, I never thought I can do that, could do that. And if I could do that, you know, climbing a mountain or rock climbing, I could do anything. And so from that place, my curiosity was really, how do I help people to integrate these experiences even more into their life? How do I support lo more long-term change? Which led me to Naropa, and I went to the dance therapy program in Naropa, started in 1997, and never left. And so as, as I was in graduate school, every opportunity that I got to do a special project on um, you know, how would you create a group, a group with some kind of special population? Or um, how would you apply this theory to something you love? Every special project I would write about wilderness therapy or adventure therapy. And then in my third year, I did an internship with Outward Bound and worked with the therapeutic population. So I worked with kids that were in the foster system. I worked with women, it was called survivors of violence, who had experienced different violence. I did um, courses with kids with cancer. And so again, it wasn't a clinical, technically clinical environment, but I was working with therapeutic groups and their therapists would come. At that point, I was also um, in this field and simultaneously learning about counseling, uh, recognizing how um, intense and these activities that we were doing could be, right? And that's where the growth comes. That's where the amazement of, oh my gosh, if I could do this, I could do anything. On the flip side, what I started noticing from my work, and especially as I started learning about somatic trauma work, was that for some people, climbing a rock put them into a state of freeze, right? And there's this uh, value and expectation in outdoor education, traditionally anyway, that is, um, you can do it. Keep going. Take one more step. If you get to the top, you will be so proud of yourself. Right? So I'd see people up on the rock and they'd go, I'm done. You know, people go, no, you can do it. Keep going. And then people would come down and be in a state of freeze. You know, not so obvious that a non clinically aware trained person would notice, but you know, pretty still, kind of in shock and um, really started using in this educational environment, in, in my outward bound work with people that were identified with trauma and those that weren't, um, started using my clinical skills just to help people ground, come back into the present moment, <laughs> unfreeze, and most of my coworkers did not have um, clinical training, and they were in awe, and they said, why did you do that, and how, how did you know to do that, and that really was helpful. And so from that place, I wrote my thesis on and created a training program for outdoor adventure educators. So those that work with people in the outdoor in this empowering way but that didn't have clinical experience on recognizing and working with trauma through body-centered interventions. And I offered my first training to a staff of a ropes course. Does anybody not know a ropes course, challenge course? Okay. So, you know, people that were sending people up on 50 foot, 25 foot ropes and um, offered this training and did a pre and post test about how it impacted their uh, facilitation skills. And from there, I love to teach. I teach at Naropa. Um, so from, from there, I started offering this, this talk and this training at conferences and for therapists. And what I found, and this was back in 2000, and I was very influenced by Peter Levine, who is well known now, especially in Boulder. Um, but at that point, his first book had come out in 97, or Waking the Tiger came out in 97. And so barely anyone that I came across had this information. And I would be in groups of therapists teaching these skills that I thought, oh, these are for the non-clinically trained people. And people would say, oh my gosh, I've never heard this in my life. And I work at a trauma center. What are you talking about? And so it became part of my life mission to actually teach somatic trauma work and kind of combine, especially with the, with the wilderness. Um, and as I was graduating from Naropa, I said to my teacher, I was TAing, and I said, um, I have a dream of starting a wilderness therapy program at Naropa. And she said, they're already starting one. 
actually it's been approved and they're um, <laughs> and they're you know looking for they're starting to hire and so I called them up and I was still a student and I said I'm a wilderness therapist and I would love to get involved in any way and so they brought me on as part of the um, hiring committee for the director of the program and I was part of that and then she hired me so Anyway, so for the last 13 or so years, however long the wilderness therapy program has been in existence, I've been a, a teaching in that, and for the first eight years was uh, the assistant director and half-time faculty there, and stepped out and am now doing that adjunctively. So that's a little bit of my background and kind of where I'm coming from and sharing this with all of you tonight. Let's see. Okay. Did you, is that training available, the one for the Rogue Squad, in any format, published? Because um, I, I used to work at a camp, and they did all these things wrong that you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> um, and they would be very open to it. Well, I ha there's two articles that I have written. One is um, in the Journal of Therapeutic Camping, and it's like a five or six page summary of the, the training that's really kind of giving some basic information. Okay. And then in the latest, um, it's an experiential education book, it's called something like Process and Practice, or Practice and Process, and it's the latest edition, which I think is the sixth edition. There's an um, article that I co-wrote about choice in experiential education, mm -hmm. and it's like 30 pages or 28 or something. And, so it really lays out all of this and the importance of choice and how not having choice is a trigger for trauma and mm -hmm. some yeah. interventions for that and framing, et cetera. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this is a photo here representing all of you. So we'd love to just get a little sense of who's in the room. And so I guess who is this one of the first <coughs> time you've seen of or heard of wilderness, wilderness therapy or nature-based therapy? Great, welcome. Um, how many of you have your own love relationship with the natural world? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and how many of you do work in the natural world? You folks. All right. Great. Okay. So. Oh, this is a, this was actually a wilderness, a Naropa trip, and we were up on the, the top of the mountain, so I don't know if some of you recognize this. Um, so I'm going to do a little imagery with you, just as we're starting to connect you with you a little bit with your personal relationship with the natural world as we're getting started. So if you are comfortable, you can either, well, actually find a seat that feels comfortable here. About five or so minutes. <coughs> if it feels comfortable to close your eyes, you can do that. Otherwise, you can have a soft gaze, whatever helps you just to be aware of your own experience here. And beginning by feeling your feet just resting down into the floor, however they are. Noticing if there's anywhere that you feel more or less pressure on the bottoms of your feet. And then bringing your attention to the contact between you and the chair beneath you and behind you. And noticing your breath without needing to change it. Just really. Noticing you, the felt sense of you in this moment, this evening. And I want to invite you to bring up an image or a connection to some kind of natural place or natural being, such as a tree or a particular creek, that you have had a positive relationship within your life. And this could be something you just came across once, or it could be the tree that you climbed in your backyard growing up. And just seeing what shows up. And 
it as this place or being, you come into connection with it, letting all of your senses wake up. So noticing any colors or detail that you see. Feeling free in this place or image to interact with this place or being. Hearing any sounds that may be present there. Feeling any textures. You may make contact with what's there or even the sensation of the air or the sun or the wind on your skin. <coughs> Noticing any smells. And noticing what it feels like to be there. Be in relationship with this being. Noticing any qualities that are present for you as you're in this place. emotions, notice what happens in your body, and from this place, without, without needing to leave, actually staying connected to whoever you are and whatever beings you may be with, I want to just invite you to speak any qualities or um, anything, <coughs> kind of any popcorn, some words, anything you're aware of in this, in this place? Belonging. Belonging. Gratitude. Gratitude. Rest. Rest. Peace. Peace. Excitement. Excitement. Safety. Safety. Happiness. Happiness. Solidity. Love. Acceptance. Love. Love. <laughs> Alive. Alive. Gratitude. Gratitude. Thank you. And so as you're ready, I'm going to invite you to bring any of these good feelings or qualities, if you would like, back with you as you transition into the room. And you can slowly wiggle your fingers and toes and slowly let the light into your eyes. So something that strikes me is I hear your words and feel that do you feel the energy that's a little different in the room? A little more of a kind of dropped in softness. Something that strikes me is that we are the natural world. Right? We are the natural world. We are part of the natural world. And there's something about being in relationship to it that often impacts our, uh, our felt sense of ourselves, our identity, our ultimately our, and our nervous system. There's something about going back to our roots, <laughs> going back to, to our, who we are on an essential level that I think is quite profound. Yeah. So I wanna, and I wanna acknowledge, and I'm gonna speak to this near the end, um, that for not everyone has a positive experience in the natural world, that there are reasons and situations where it's actually not necessarily um, supportive or therapeutic for people. So I'm kind of making, talking a lot about how it is, um, but just to acknowledge that that is not true for everyone. There are other considerations. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to give you some definitions and kind of overview, understanding of the field, especially for those of you that this is fairly new to. 
So um, under nature-based therapy, I think, I, I love the word nature-based therapy. I often, I use that a lot. Sometimes I use wilderness therapy for what I do, but a lot of what I do isn't necessarily in the wilderness, but does have relationship with the natural world. So I use that um, kind of to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, in the field, wilderness therapy, in the field of wilderness therapy and adventure therapy in the literature, um, these two words have historically been used pretty interchangeably, which is a little funny to me because wilderness has a very different connotation and energy than the word adventure, right? But because this has been a field that has really, it's grown from the grassroots up, um, they've, they've sometimes, um, adventure and wilderness have often both been a component in what people have called wilderness therapy. In the last, um, well, like I said, 94 is the first book that I'm aware of that was called Wilderness Therapy. There's a bunch of resources here if you want to look. There's a great updated one um, from, I think, a, about a year or two ago that came out, Adventure Therapy, Theory, Research, and Practice. But between those times, you know, there's been a lot of dialogue amongst practitioners about what, who are we? What are we doing? What makes this? You know, what are our best practices? Are we wilderness? Are we adventure? Um, how do those two go together? But these have been big in, if, you, if you're if you doing research or kind of looking at the, like I said, the, the research or the literature. So I love this definition. I think Deb Pranian, who's the director of the Wilderness Therapy Program, made up this definition. And so at Naropa, this is what we use. The conscious incorporation of the natural world into the therapeutic process. So that's similar to my um, definition of nature-based therapy. Um, Chris over here did a great thesis on um, kind of bringing, bringing nature back into wilderness therapy. <laughs> okay, and um, I love it, it's been such a great resource to like look at all the definitions that people in the field, you know, there's a great definition I read to my students and it says, as the word, as the term implies, wilderness therapy sounds like it should be done in the wilderness. <laughs> Often it is, but it not necessarily. It means that you're in an environment that is um, outside of your normal surroundings, mm -hmm. right? And that was in one of the, also one of the first wilderness therapy books nine, published in 97 by Gas called Adventure Therapy. So anyway, I, I like sort of looking at what's being written about and spoken about. Um, Okay, so adventure, and so so to that to say, a lot of people would have different definitions. So I'm using that definition here today. Um, and then with adventure therapy, the prescriptive use of adventure experiences provided by mental health professionals, often conducted in natural settings, that kinesthetically engage clients on cognitive, affective, and behavioral <coughs> levels. It took until 2013 to come up with that definition. That's in the, this newest book which is very inclusive and written by um, clinicians and researchers. So you know, <coughs> the, the prescriptive use of adventure experiences provided by mental health professionals often conducted in natural settings that kinesthetically engage clients on cognitive, affective, and behavioral levels. Any comments or questions here? Yeah. Um, I had a friend who said he did adventure therapy. He said it wasn't regulated, and he wasn't a therapist. He just people out for years and years and years and so um on his own or through an organization uh, he would contract uh-huh oh wow so this is a this is a huge discussion here um mm -hmm. uh so in my in my career in my 25 years of working in the wilderness i can't tell you how many people i have met who said that they either they invented wilderness or adventure therapy <laughs> or that or that they thought they had invented wilderness or adventure therapy. Somebody just said that to me a couple weeks ago at dinner. So um, it's really been this grassroots thing that started not without therapists doing it. And even today, I'll say traditional wilderness therapy programs that we see on TV, like Brat Camp Show, there's youth at risk that go out for days at a time. It's therapy program. There are therapists on staff and the people who are with the, the clients 24 seven are not therapists. They're um, eager, wide-eyed, good-loving people who can want to hang out with and 
love and support youth for a long time and get really good at intuitively learning and through experience um, event, um, more interventions that are useful. So, you know, I think that the big, a big discussion that I like to bring in when we're looking at this is what are the terms we're using? Because wilderness therapy or adventure therapy at this point to me connotes that the contract is therapy, right? And then I think a lot of work such as Outward Bound, right, or Women's Wilderness Institute or whatever it might be, it's very therapeutic. It's experiential education. There's a lot of processing, debriefing, integrating this into your life. What did you learn from this? It's therapeutic, but it's not therapy. So I think people in the who are doing outdoor work um, use these terms very loosely, have historically used these terms very loosely, and I think there's been a lot of confusion around that. Yeah. No, I really appreciate you spending time talking about this, and I'll well, express <coughs> my ignorance for someone yeah. who's not familiar <coughs> with this world, having clients who have experiences where they're like taken out of their homes in the middle of the night, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and sort of traumatized by that or come seeking treatment, yeah. secondary mm -hmm. to that, but then maybe have these experiences in nature and then are sort of confused how to make sense of it, and I don't really know what to call it or how therapeutic it was or is, and it, it's just sort of hard to know yes. what their experience is or, or even how to justify how it could be therapeutic that someone would be taken yeah. out of their room in the middle of the night screaming and that, that would have some, <laughs> some benefit. Yeah, <laughs> so you were outside after, you know. Yeah, so I'll describe like, this is what she's talking about here for those of you who don't know. So, so in um, intensive wilderness therapy programs, again, we often, we often think of youth at risk. So mostly it's 18 and under, though there are similar programs for young adults. Um, what happens a lot of times is parents get to this place where they go, our child's out of control, mm -hmm. they're gonna kill themselves, they're gonna OD, you know, and they're panicked. And they call up an educational consultant who helps them find the right program, who calls up a b um, escort, a big, generally dude, that comes to their house and wakes them up in the middle of the night and escorts them out and escorts them wow. to another state, to a wilderness <laughs> therapy program, and they walk in and they take all their clothes and their supplies and they say, you are now living on the earth for the next 30 to 60 days and cooking your own food and here you are. So yes, I mean, I think absolutely, I can't imagine that not being traumatic for someone. And often it's at the point where people are like, they're gonna kill themselves and we don't know what else to do. And there are you know, better escort programs than others and some parents are part of it where they'll come or they'll say, oh, they'll stay connected with their child and it's happening and you know, it's pretty intense, yeah. <laughs> I have yeah. a, I almost briefly have a client who went through that and mm -hmm. it actually re-triggered a rape experience she had. Yeah. It was that three gentlemen and, yeah. and the place they took her to and they were actually part of the organization, I think, it absolutely blew her mind and were life-changing. So it's an yeah. incredible paradox. Yes. Uh -huh. of, it couldn't have gone worse, actually, and the parents didn't know that she had that. And these were good parents. These were parents that were really didn't know how to help her, and she was explosive, not compliant, and super sensitive. And as yeah. a young, young kid, two years wow. old, and just freaking out, and the parents are like, what do we do? Wow. And then became a teenager and just drugs and everything else. Uh -huh. So it was such a mixed bag. Um, yeah. And she had done some treatment centers before then, and that's where she was assaulted, was at another treatment center oh, um, by a peer. It oh, was a wilderness type of thing. Um, right. Nobody's fault, it just you know, right. happened. Um, but the place she ended up at, through being escorted, saved her life. Yes. And was the first time she had been in an environment. It actually helped her heal the previous bad experiences. Yes. Unconditional love, like a really beautiful philosophy. Thank you for sharing so, that. Yes, so I'll say, you know, it's of course all kinds of experiences in wilderness therapy, but it is amazingly life-changing for many people, which is why they are growing and existing out there. Um, and and I also want to say that's, that's only one part of the field. So this is, a, this is often what we think about with the, what's most well-known in terms of wilderness therapy. But <coughs> it's becoming much more widespread, which I'll also talk about, but thanks for talking about that part. Okay. Um, oh no. <coughs> I need to be more. Well, <coughs> it's 
he's going to die in a moment. Um, <coughs> let's see. Well, when it dies, then we'll do something else. <laughs> okay. So, um, another <coughs> side of nature-based therapy, big influence for um, Neuroba Wilderness Therapy Program, which is eco-psychology. And so, um, in the, what we talk about it, at Neuroba and the Wilderness, okay. Therapy Master's program is really, it's a lot of mix of adventure therapy and eco-psychology. So we are bringing in the adventure pieces because they are so impactful for people. And we're bringing in eco-psychology, which the Rojak, who wrote an eco-psychology book, anthology, great book if you're interested in this, um, his definition is, it studies the relationship between human beings and the natural world through ecological and psychological principles. And essentially, it's the idea that we are our mental health and our physical health and our well-being is intricately connected with the well-being of the earth and the planet, and that it is that it's both working on ourselves and our own relationship to the natural world, and working directly with the natural world, and then noticing how that impacts us. Joanna Macy is someone that's out there doing beautiful work. If you're interested in checking out her work, a lot of grief work with the earth and um, witnessing witnessing places that have been harmed. And then ecotherapy, uh, it's the applied eco-psychology that impacts healing and growth nurtured by healthy interaction with the earth. And there's a great website, ecotherapyheals.com if you want more info. There's also a great book, I don't know if I brought it, which is, um, yeah, I don't even know how to say it. It's Linda Bun Bunzel and Craig Chalquist, and it's ecotherapy. Um, I wonder, if, you know, you, would you help me with a plug? And then I'll just keep talking and then you can plug in my computer. Um, oh, okay. oh, there's one right there. They'll just take this information. It's mixed up with another plug. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, any comments, questions on that? Okay, so just to talk a little bit about the historical roots of this field, um, when you look at the books, oh my gosh, train. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Am I hearing noises? Thank you. Uh -huh. When you look at the books that talk about the history of wilderness therapy, um, a lot of them mention earth-based cultures and looking at the connection that we all, all of our ancestors had in living with the earth and really knowing the ways of the earth and knowing the healing properties of plants and the seasons and sort of living in that closeness. And I think that's more, you know, that clearly wasn't therapy, that was a way of life, but looking at really an influence that is there. And then... Um, so another a great story that is also in the books, and this is documented, is the tent study. And this is not an official research study, but in the early 1900s, there was a, an outbreak of what was there now? tuberculosis. Tur yes, thank you, tuberculosis. And at a hospital in New York City, they were overflowing. And so it was the summer, and they took the psych patients out and had them camp on the lawn in tents all summer because they needed more room. And what happened, what they observed and documented is that many of their symptoms extremely lessened or went away during this time when they were, um, <laughs> 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 um, during the time they were living in tents out on the lawn. And so it was so notable that it's, you know, been passed down through um, information. And I'll just say, when I, before I went to graduate school, I worked as a milieu therapist with 62 chronically mentally ill adults in a transitional housing program that was 24 hours supported and they were not transitioning out unless they were going to the psych hospital. Mostly schizophrenia, bipolar with psychosis, pretty severe um, diagnoses. They couldn't live on their own. And at that point, I was just, you know, I said, I just like try anything. So I petitioned, this was 95, I petitioned the 
uh, clinicians and the director, can I take these people camping? And they said yes. So I, along with a few of my colleagues, took a group of like seven willing participants to a, a car camping place. And similarly, these parts of them that had never seen before, this sense of aliveness and ease and humor came out. It was so beautiful. So it's ama amazing just to see and feel the difference that can happen for people. Thanks. Um, and then the scouting movement back in the early 1900s, and it was boy scouting that started, and really looking at the benefits and, again, the, that people were gaining from being outside and doing things for themselves, kind of making fires, you know, packing their bags, et cetera. Um, outward Bound is often talked about. So uh, Outward Bound came from Europe, from England and Scotland. Kurt Hahn was uh, German. And he spoke out against Hitler during that time. He got banished to um, England and spent time. He was an educator, uh, creating. He was creating schools, and he was also very political. And during this time, the the government asked him to do some study about, you know, why are at this time of war, why are our younger men at sea dying and not our older men who are fighting? Because we would think that the older men. Um, don't have as much energy, don't have as much strength, that when they're getting, you know, st stuck in the water, kind of left out there for a while, that they would be the ones dying. But it's actually the younger men that are dying. And however he came to this, what his um, answer was, was that it was the older men had life experience, and through that life experience, they had this sense of tenacity, and that I can get through this. I know I can get through this. I just need to hang on, I've gone through hard things before, and I'm gonna to get to the other side. Whereas without that life experience, there was less um, trust in that, less kind of um, trust in themselves. And so from that, what the result was actually creating some schools, both in England and Scotland, um, that were originally for boys, and were um, basically the outward bound model, going on expeditions, going on you know, 14 day canoe trips, 14 day backpacking trips, where they had to survive together and go through adversity, and they were finding great results. And then in, ninth, I forget what year they came, 62, oh, they came to um, the US and started what's known as Outward Bound here. And um, again, you know, with outdoor education started before this started, this was brought into the clinical world. But what was happening is, again, people were seeing, whether it was through something organized like Outward Bound or people taking out their friends, you know, or having their own spontaneous awakening <coughs> on the land, saying there is something really powerful here. You know, I'm going in one way, coming out another. You know, or seeing people's loved ones going, oh my gosh, you're totally different. What happened out there? And so it was a real um, influence in the starting to be incorporated casually and officially into the clinical process. Okay, so this is uh, present day application. So we were talking about more of the traditional adventure wilderness therapy programs, and there are many across this country and many other countries at this point. And um, really what this looks like is often people, I mean, sometimes there's a base camp and the groups go out for several days on an expedition and then come back and spend some time at base camp. And some of them, they just go out there for generally 30 to 60 days is kind of the amount of time. And there are group, group kind of therapy, group processing every day. Their therapist generally comes out and does individual sessions with people once or twice a week. Um, some of the programs, they make their own bedroll out of sticks and tarps and string and they carry everything like that on their back and have a little pot this big that's both their bowl and their pot to cook on the fire and they do bow drill to get their fire started. So those are what some some components of wilderness adventure therapy. And then rites of passage or quest work and School of Lost Borders is, a, is actually the really the founders of this work in the U.S. and um, School of Lost Borders was create. They created a vision quest ceremony that was. Um, they say it's a pan cultural ceremony that was 
really looking at, you know, what are the ceremonies that Earth-based cultures have done over time, sending their young ones out on the land to survive, or, you know, looking at the, the wandering in the desert, the going out and finding who am I really, and what is, you know, what are my strengths that I didn't know that were here, and again, going through adversity. And so, um, Meredith Little and Stephen Foster created a four-day solo fast model and many, many people have trained in that around the world. I heard the other day that they have, I think, I want to say 40, approximately 40 trainings offered this coming year, and two-thirds of them are full. <coughs> so this has been a huge, um, I, I feel like it's a huge impact on our culture. There's a lot more organizations offering these programs. And rites of passage is a, is a very general term. It's a term developed by an anthropologist, a European anthropologist, that really is looking at ceremonies that mark some sort of life transition. So it's a general world, word, and it's being done in many different ways. I was just in a meeting two, two weeks ago in Boulder of 30 people in the Boulder community who are doing rites of passage with youth. So this is a huge community doing this work. And I, again, in my time working on the land, I have seen this explode really that and I feel like in contrast to you know all the chaos that's happening in our world there's such a longing for meaning and longing for um, ceremony and longing for elders to mirror us and, and you know and, and have adversity so did you say there was an organization for like or some sort of group that you went to that yeah well there's a, a networking group that's starting that just got started in Boulder. I want to know about that group. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not open at this moment. It's oh. just there. It's kind of the visioning group, but I'll talk to you about it. We okay. know each other. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, and right now it's like the first steps of visioning of even uh, there might be a web a web page getting created is okay. kind of the next step and okay. starting to network. There's also an inner um, or a national group that's called something like Youth Quest for youthrightsofpassage.com, and apparently they're looking at that organization as a bit of a model, but doing it more locally, and they kept referring to this, and if you can't find it, let me know, and I'll find you the actual information on that as well. Yeah, and so this is something I am very passionate about, um, because it's really about going out on the land and engaging your own relationship with the land, and the land becomes um, so many things. You, it becomes um, an other that you ha are in relationship with and interconnected with. It also becomes a mirror, you know, and a, a thing to project upon, like we do to humans in our lives. And there's often, in my experience, a spiritual component of synchronicity that shows up in the most profound ways all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so Kelly's done some um, wilderness therapy, nature-based therapy training that being is up in the front here. And we were talking today. She was in my office and I'm um, talking about some relationship pieces and bringing the natural world into her work. And all of a sudden, a fly came down and landed on her finger and sat there for a while, which is, I've never seen that happen in my office ever. She said, way to bring nature into that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great. So amazing synchronicity that happens. I was um, working with someone, so one of the things I do, I have an office in Boulder that has great views of the sliding glass doors out onto a deck overlooking El Dorado's Canyon. So I joke that I do wilderness therapy in my office. It's just on the other side of the glass. But I also meet people out on the trail often. And um, when, one day I was working with someone, and we were walking, and she, we were doing some dream work. She just got finished telling me about her dream where she and two other people were riding on horses and came around this corner and saw this open space and all of a sudden three horses came around the corner on Boulder open space just right here, which I had not seen before there. So it's, yeah, incredible the synchronicity. So rites of passage and um, that model is something I love. It's something we incorporate also into the wilderness therapy program at Naropa as a kind of a culmination the second year before stepping into internship. So also some kind of nature-based pieces, ways of working with the natural world and therapy that are getting bigger here is equine therapy. 
how many of you know about equine therapy? Also getting really big in Boulder. We live in such an amazing therapeutic mecca here and creative, creative therapeutic mecca. So equine with horses, working with really re relationship with horses. Some people use them as group initiatives. So some people, it's like, get your horse from here to there. What happened? Kind of like a ropes course. Other people do it more um, attachment-based or more really relationship-based and projection-based. And so there are a lot of pieces working with a living being in relationship that is interactive, different than a tree, that um, can actually really bring up some evocative material and really a lot to work with that is um, in the relationship realm. And then horticulture therapy is also getting bigger and there's trainings in this which is incorporating really working with the earth um, into the therapeutic process. And so there are more and more programs, some wilderness therapy programs and some farming programs that are bringing in um, a, a horticulture component into them. There's Pacific Quest in Hawaii. So many people I know, that's like their dream job. It's one of the only wilderness therapy programs out in Hawaii and they have a whole horticulture piece to it. We're looking at preschools for our daughter and they're building a new JCC or at the JCC. And they told us that they, are in the new building, they're making gardening like an integral part of the preschool. Right. And they're going to have full-blown gardens where everything's edible, so that and they grow everything. And it's, wow. they, they want it to be part of their culture. That cool. is so cool. I think Waldorf incorporates a lot, a lot of nature-based work as well. I yeah. I have this dream, actually. There's so many clients <laughs> that I've worked with who um, are in crisis, but there's not a great place for them to go. Like the hospital really isn't the place to go. Treatment center is not quite the place to go. And there's nowhere to go, and they don't have support. And I have this dream that we're going to have so many farm communities that people could go and live at and work on and take respite there or you know contribute so there can be some reciprocity and space. And so, yeah, I think, and there are therapeutic farms and actually even more more um, popping up, so it's, it's my dream, hopefully that will. <laughs> and then, so just some different ways that um, nature-based therapy is being practiced. And so one is the primary therapy. So again, you know, some programs are all outdoors. I also do, in, in through my private practice, I do intensives with people. So I'll do sometimes weekend or week long one-on-one, -on -one, or I've worked with couples. I have a colleague that I, a man or a woman, depending on the couple that comes out, we go out together and do that. I've done it with families. And it's an amazing, intensive experience to be out there for a while. And then that becomes that the environment as well as the, uh, like being out there, living out there, and the relationship with the natural world is um, becomes the co-therapist. I talk about nature as co-therapist or collaborating with the natural world because it really becomes another therapist in the process. So that's primary kind of primary treatment modalities. And then um, community clinics, right? So there are there's a great program. I think probably the best pro the program that's doing this the best in Chicago, and is called Omni. Um, and they're an inpatient outpatient or no, not an inpatient. Sorry. Um, an outpatient kind of clinic and mental health center. And they work with kids, adolescents, adults, families, couples, individuals, etc. It's very extensive. And they have a whole adventure therapy team. And they um, do challenge course activities. They do group initiatives, which is kind of challenge course without the ropes. They take groups of kids who are in support groups together out on expeditions. And so it's kind of a mix of both which is really fabulous. Um, and then I talked to you a little bit about private practice. I'll say in this community, there are a lot of people integrating the natural world in different ways into their private practice, especially because we have all these now Naropa Wilderness Therapy grads and Prescott College is where Chris went to school. And um, they have an adventure therapy master's program there and eco psychology program. So a lot of people getting really creative here and integrating the work into their um, their work with people. 
And then adjunctive, and what I mean by that is, so let's see, AIM House, for instance, right? They're a mostly a residential program here in town for youth. And then they contract sometimes folks to take out a student who's, or a client who's having a hard time and sometimes go do a one-on-one -on -one week with them and then bring them back into the milieu. Or sometimes they'll offer a trip to Mission Wolf um, down in Southern Colorado to go hang, hang out with the wolves in their area as part, and with a camping trip as part of the treatment. So it's great, so it's, the, it, it's adjunctive. Or they might go and have a primary therapist that's an equine therapist that they see outside of the treatment and then kind of integrate their learning back into the milieu. Yeah, maybe an obvious question, but I wonder how, how, do, how do people protect clients' confidentiality? That is a great question. People ask this all the time. That. Yeah. I'll tell you what I do. I mean, I just have a conversation with people and I say, so do you want to go outside? And if we go outside, if they say yes. So if this is where I'm thinking of going, how do you feel about that? We're gonna, you know, be out in public. What do you want to do about that? I'm not gonna tell anybody that you're my client. And so what I do is, you know, do generally, sometimes people wanna walk the whole time. I've had people that that's what they wanna do and um, there's something that's helpful around not going into free state. And then a lot of people like, will kind of find a place behind a rock or by the creek that's more private. So really, you know, you, you can't, I mean, here you are, but no one really knows what I'm doing. And so, yeah. exactly, <laughs> and they're giving their consent. And then I, and I make it really explicit. So if they don't want to do that, then they don't, they don't need to do that. So that's kind of how I work with it. Make it part of the process. Yes, exactly. I was thinking about someone the other day said to me, I want to talk to you about how you do these different roles with people, which I do have a lot of roles because I, <laughs> because I teach graduate students and I do coaching and I do therapy and I teach trainings. And, but they're, they said, you know, so I do coaching and therapy, but if I'm going to take my client outdoors, like, isn't that changing the relationship? And I said, well, it's not for me because this is what